Joanna, Jo, Jo, Joanna. Ay, ay, ay. Give it to them. Joanna, you bad, you don't need no lights. Give it to them. When we step up in the place, you don't need no lights. Give it to them. Every time you walk, yeah, shake it like three dice. Give it to them. You know I'm trying to take you out like three strikes. Freaky like Madonna. Give it to them. For Joanna, I lied to you, Anna. Out, out in the tropics and Tropicana. Ooh. On the block, black, black drop, rag top like I'm Pakistani. See? See, life is like a sandwich. Either way you turn it, the bread come first. Uh -huh. I'll be the club, then pull up in the hearse. <laughs> Haters get chalked. Ten years run New York. Hey. No, ten. Joanna, your busy body giving me life, oh. Hey, life, hey. Give it to, you to me like that. Joanna. Jo, Jo, Joanna. Why you do me like that? Hey, Joanna. Jo, Jo. All right, folks, plenty of action still to come with our bodybuilding a little bit later in the program. Right now, we're going to invite the great Milos Sarsev on stage. Very special seminar here for all the fans in Dubai. A great chance to get the IFBB superstar, the mind, Milos Sarsev. He's going to share some of the secrets he's learned over the years. Training techniques, diet, nutrition, posing. A walking encyclopedia when it comes to bodybuilding. So we're going to have Milos come on stage in just a few moments. For those interested, the bodybuilding will start at 345 right here on stage, 345. In the meantime, enjoy the seminar. And, of course, visit our expo vendors located right outside. They've got great stuff, free supplements for you guys, free samples, and, of course, lots of information on their companies and products. Enjoy the seminar. 345, back here for the bodybuilding.
guys. All right, just in a few minutes, we're going to do a live seminar with a man who needs an introduction. Grab your seats, get ready for some questions. We're just arranging ourselves here. And then we're going to be introducing a man to the stage that can ask questions related to any topic aligned with supplements, nutrition, training. All right, good afternoon. I would like to welcome you to the biggest fitness, bodybuilding, and educational event stage ever witnessed in the history of Dubai. This incredible opportunity, an extensive educational seminar sponsored by Swiss Nutrition and organized by Mission Strong, held right here in Dubai's Pro Show. I am proud and honored to be the moderator of such an iconic event, ensuring that the event runs smoothly and that our guest has the best to welcome. We have fans and enthusiastic join you live and a huge online global audience ready to listen, make notes, and have an opportunity to ask questions. And I will do my best to see that you all leave here today with more knowledge on nutrition and supplements. I am Christian Williams, Dubai's personal trainer of the year, body transformation coach, and I am personally ecstatically excited for today's guest. I've been wanting to meet the man for years. But before introducing him to this stage, let's take a moment to appreciate our sponsors and organizers of such an iconic event. Swiss Nutrition is a supplement company that are devoted to continuously researching, partending, producing, and globally marketing the safest and most effective diet and sports supplements to assist in achieving fitness goals. Swiss Nutrition are a supplement company that uses only the best supplements and ingredients in the world. Mission Strong, is a healthcare, fitness, and sports event organizing company based in India, UAE, USA. Mission Strong is a platform that brings together the world's best creators, experts, and icons to learn and interact. Mission Strong regularly carries out independent live peer reviewed and webcasts on a variety of specialities. And today, Mission Strong has brought a man that needs a little introduction, one of the most brilliant minds in the sport of bodybuilding. A man whose fascination with losing fat, building muscle, maximizing performance, and transforming the human body led him to achieving one of the best physiques in the world. Competing more than almost anyone in the sport, and following a lengthy career in bodybuilding spanning over three decades, he devoted his passion to helping other athletes compete to the highest standards. And he is arguably one of the best bodybuilding coaches in the world. He has helped many of the greats to grace the stage. Giants like Flex Wheeler, Dennis Wolf, Dennis James, Nasser El Sabati, just to name a few. And he is also helping those with the potential bringing them to the lights and maximizing their progress. He was born in Bechi, Serbia, and he is now in Dubai, on this very stage. And I would like you to join me and give him a huge round of applause and welcome. They call him the mind, Milos Sarchev. Milos, welcome to Dubai, welcome to the stage. Hello? Okay. There we go, there we go. All right. So f <clears throat> first, uh, thanks to everybody that uh, attended this seminar. I would really like to tell you one thing. Many times people listen to me, but they don't hear me. So I want you to hear me. 
what I mean by that, what I'm saying is really something I want to share with you that you accept. Please think what I say. If it makes sense, I hope you're going to actually start doing it. Uh, so, we have a very short time and I'm going to get straight to the point. What do we want to achieve in every aspect of life? Maximal, optimal, or minimal results. Maximal. So for bodybuilders in extreme sport, if you really want to maximize everything, we have to first realize what gets us there. Training-wise, nutritionally, supplementation, recuperation, all these have to be put in the calculation for your daily activities. So I'm all about maximization, okay? A lot of people, uh, they start bodybuilding for a couple of reasons. One, to build as much muscle mass, and two, to lose as much body fat. Can you do both at the same time? Yes, you can. So my message to everyone is that uh, once you start bodybuilding, analyze where you are at. If you need to burn body fat, don't think of, I need to burn body fat before I uh, build muscle. Or if you need to build muscle, let me put on weight and later I'm going to uh, burn body fat. I did always all at once, and that's why I was in shape year around. I competed 110 times, as a, 72 times as a pro, and I qualified for Olympia 10 years in a row. So everything is possible. Don't have excuse of, I want off season, I want to eat big to get big, to grow. You can grow very specifically. Do you need to ask me something? No? No, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> what do I do with all of my clients? You heard him say, Nasser somebody was one of my first ones, Dennis James, Dennis Wolf, Hiratari Amagishi, uh, Gustavo Badel, you name it, right now. Samson Dauda, actually, he just sent me the pictures. You can see on Instagram from today what he looks like. For all these athletes, I always set exact same plan in the mind of we need to feed the body and we need to stimulate the muscle growth. And then if you need to burn body fat, we need to include all that in a one day. So for all of you that heard me say before, my diet is not 12 weeks diet, 16 weeks diet. My diets are 24 hour diets. In these 24 hours a day, I can create Fat burning phase that I use to burn body fat, maintenance phase to maintain, and then anabolic phase to build. So all of you, starting tomorrow, if you really define in each part of the day, I know what I'm doing, what are you doing? You need to burn fat, you have a fat burning phase. You need to stimulate the muscle and initiate the growth, you need that anabolic phase. And then you need to maintain it. So that way, each and every day, you can build muscle and burn body fat. You need to increase at a higher level. You have a competition sooner. You do more of the fat burning phase. You are in an off season uh, plan. You need to put on some more muscle. You focus more on the anabolic phase. So th this is how it is. Uh, I'm going to let everybody ask the questions. So I don't know if it's better if you would want me to let you speak now so I can answer the question particularly or you want me to finish my uh, presentation. It's brilliant. And actually, you must have read my mind. One of the things I wanted to really mm -hmm. ask you on stage, which I know the audience will be very beneficial of, mm -hmm. is achieving fat loss and muscle gain. At the same time. At the same time. So obviously you're talking about nutrient timing. When specifically would you put more fats in, more carbohydrates, yes. and would you consider protein to be like a baseline in somebody's diet? Yes, okay. So the question is, how do I time my nutrients? So every client I have, Samson Dudo right now, if I would do your diet, my diet, you would have to first start from a, a physiological needs of the body. So that's that BMR, everybody heard, basic metabolic rate, your height, your weight, your age, your gender. It's easy to calculate. 
and then you add everything that you do daily. Any physical activity that burns calories, you have to account it for. And then what do you want to do? Build and lose body fat. To lose body fat, you have to make sure that you do the activity to burn fat as a fuel. Aerobic activity burns fat as a fuel. And if in the body, in the bloodstream at that time, there is no carbohydrates and you use aerobic activity, 60%, 65% of a maximum heart rate, it's going to 100% burn fat. So I would like to initiate fat burning with a morning cardio and empty stomach, nothing in a, absolutely not even glutamine, creatine, essential amino acids, BCAs, nothing. You want no nutrients. You want to in a fasted state to do the cardio because it's going to use fatty acids. You don't have it in the bloodstream. You're going to get from the body fat. So instantly, first thing that's going to happen, you're going to start burning body fat. As soon as cardio is done, now you want to switch anabolic phase and maintenance phase. You have already burned some fat in this process. Okay? You elevate metabolism for the next several hours. Now you have to feed the body. So according to my training schedule, if I train in the morning or train in the afternoon or train twice a day, I would form my meals according to when my training is. The whole day have to be constant supply of uh, amino acids from the protein sources. You guys heard me say I'm a very big believer in the high protein. I was taking up to four grams of protein per kilo of body weight, if you go by kilos, or uh, two grams per pound of body weight if you go by pounds. Distributed in small frequent meals throughout the day. So you would have a constant efflux of amino acids in the bloodstream, okay? Every meal you have, from breakfast to the dinner, if it's eggs and chicken and turkey and fish and beef and whatever, it's going to give you amino acids in the bloodstream once it's digested and uh, uh, available. So that's going to create enough amino acids for any building needs. It's not just building needs of a muscle, but protein synthesis, muscle protein synthesis. Every tissue in the body, organs, enzymes, hormones, it need, they need amino acids. So this is the first need. The second need is energy nutrients, carbohydrates or fat. How much you give them? It's according to your maintenance phase and anabolic phase. For everybody, it's a little bit different, a little bit, but it's not that much. Lucky guys that have a high metabolism can possibly combine carbohydrates and fats together because they have a fat metabolism and regulated fat burning is no problem. Then you have uh, people, they're very sensitive to carbs, that maybe you have to replace the carbs with fats when you are in maintenance phase. And then you have a lucky guys that they can eat carbs all day long. And for them, you can have a carbs as a fuel in all these six meals throughout the day. So the bottom line is that you want to have enough building nutrients and then enough energy nutrients. If you monitor this and you are constantly inconsistent and you inspect what you expect, which is every day you see or you are improving or you are maybe getting fat or you are not building the muscle, it's a time when you start adjusting. But the basic rule for you to set up is create your meals throughout the day and put them in a fat burning phase, maintenance phase, and anabolic phases. It's brilliant. I mean, and it's, it's funny because it's heavily debated uh, in the industry for decades, really. Some people, they go on a supreme bulk and cut. And, and I've always thought of it strategically. Anything that works on a linear can work, like you were saying, on a daily basis. Yeah, you don't have to spend three months in one phase and three months in another. Hello. So that's fantastic. What we're going to do now, we're going to open it up to some questions from the audience, first of all. So let's try to keep our questions centered around, obviously, nutrition, supplements, training. And we have one hour less than, so we try to get us through as many questions as we can. So make your question specific. And yes, you, sir, if you was, do we have a mic at the front row, please? Dr. George. Dr. George. 
Dr. George, okay. How hello, Milo, it's good to see you here. Good to see you, Dr. George. So, uh, in the recent uh, issue of muscular development of October, uh, in your column, you answer one uh, ans a question referring, if we have a lagging body part, do we need to train this once a week or twice a week? And you said that you don't believe in overtraining, you believe in lack of sleep and uh, deficiency of nutrition. Yes. So, people believe that if I blast uh, a body part once a week, I need recovery for seven days. But you believe if you lack of a uh, body part, you should train it twice a week? Yeah, and in, in case you sleep well and you eat well? Okay, so the question, you know, if everybody is uh, listening and to understand, Dr. George asked me, for a lacking body part, what would I do? Train that lack, lacking body part only once a week or twice a week, or maybe even more? At least twice a week. Why? Because my anabolic phase, when I train that body part, is going to anabolize that particular muscle. So for me, more is always more. This uh, whole new trend, less is more, infrequent, don't train so much, you need to recuperate. I train six days a week, twice a day, every body part twice a week for 15 years straight. When I talk to uh, Jay Cutler, Dennis James, all these guys, if you listen to my podcast, they all train twice a day. There's no such a thing as overtraining. If you have a 24 hours a day, you're a pro bodybuilder, okay, you're gonna get in the gym for that one hour, maybe hour and a half, and blast your muscles. Try to stimulate, to create the shock, to initiate that hypertrophy process. So, would I benefit more from only once? Because somebody tells me, you need to recuperate. Once a week is enough. It's not enough. It's absolutely not enough. Yes, your body is growing when you are resting, but twice a week is nothing. This is basically super minimal amount. I'm not going to even say optimal, because I know that many guys are training just once a week each body part. Uh, they don't want to maximize. For them, optimization is okay. You want to focus on a lacking body part? I'm going to bomb you twice a week, and then what am I going to do? I'm going to create that hyperemia advantage, which is, for those of you that don't understand, increased blood flow to the muscle only happens when you train. So if you train that lacking body part only once a week, only once a week, that hyperemia and blood flow goes to that muscle. If you train twice a week, now I have a two opportunities to stimulate the muscle, initiate the growth, and feed it. So my theory in the supplementation is, I'm going to saturate your blood with all the pre-digested anabolic nutrients. I'm going to cause anabolic hormone release in a time when these nutrients are in the blood and blood is in the muscle, and now I'm gonna expose the muscle for crazy stimulation, any kind of training. Heavy duty, the, the, the giant sets that I, uh, I do, people misconcept my training that I do just giant sets, no. I do something heavy duty, progressive overload, you know, typical heavy duty style, and then I do my intensification of supersets, giant sets, drop sets, prolonged time and attention, peak contraction, four points of the exercise, eccentric, lengthened, concentric, shortened. I try to stimulate muscle differently. I do all kinds of stimulation for that particular muscle because now I know that blood is there, nutrients are there, released insulin is there that's gonna store everything in that particular muscle. So I would be able to do it twice a week for my lacking body part, what other experts say it's only once. My type of training also ensures that nutrients are gonna be inserted into the muscle. So if just logically, if anybody here is uh, thinking about it, you wanna deliver this particular thing into the chest, right? 
And this particular thing is maybe amino acids, creatine, glutamine, beta alanine, citrulline, glucose, doesn't matter. It's already available. As soon as I take it, it goes to my bloodstream, and now I push the blood into the muscle. And when the, this particular thing is here, insulin is going to take it out of the blood in the first available cells and tissues. The only available cell and tissue is a muscle cell of exact muscle that I'm training. So I'm directing it. If I color this in the black color, my pecs are going to turn black. This is my vision. This is how I always understood. It's not double blind study on some university confirmed. It is bro science that I'm going to say that bro science is way ahead of the science in the bodybuilding department. Because as you know, you are the doctor and you're a scientist. Scientists have to come up with some study that they're going to come up with something and they're going to test untrained subjects. Bro science of a pro bodybuilder, we are training with Olympia level competitors that we try to improve already guys that reach plateau. So when you can improve top pro Olympian and you can see the difference, there is something to it. So just to, to clarify this, uh, Dr. George, I would always insist on more is better twice a week. I actually had a guys that I trained three times a week the same body part and just push the nutrients, push the nutrients, push the nutrients. They need to rest and recuperate properly, but even if you train the muscle three times a week, it's no overtraining. I think Dr. George is a great question and a great yeah. answer. So that's fantastic there. All right. Yes, we have another question in the front. There you go. Hi, Milos. Uh, hello. I attended your seminar back in 2019. How are you? Hello, hello. So I wanted to ask, what are your thoughts on giant sets and what are the best times to incorporate them? You know why I'm asking this question. Uh, can you repeat this question? a little bit uh, louder because we don't, uh, we don't Giant know. sets. When is the best giant time you giant suggest sets? to incorporate giant sets? Because I remember when we did your course, that was the first thing you, yes. you did with us. So Back in 2019. Yeah, so and, and who are the, the kind of athletes that you suggest should incorporate giant sets into their routine and their training routine? How often? So and so forth. So how often? Every, every time. <laughs> so <laughs> for me, okay, each and every day is an opportunity to improve. What you do nutritionally to improve your nutrition and body composition is one thing. But what you do in the gym training-wise is to stimulate maximum amount of muscle fiber of that targeting muscle group. So how do you stimulate maximum amount of muscle fiber? If I train legs, for example, glutes for, for women or whatever you guys want to do. So you want to stimulate both fast twitch and slow twitch muscle fiber. You want to do something typically heavy duty, hardcore bodybuilding type that uh, you use heavier weight, uh, less repetition protocols to cause that myofibril hypertrophy, okay? Muscle damage, you go all out, right? But then you want to bring that nut nutrition in a crazy pump, volumization type of training that is giant sets like, which is sarcoplasmic specific. So you go with just for a crazy pump as Arnold Schwarzenegger back in the day was saying, you know, you go in the, in the gym to achieve that crazy pump. The difference from normal training with a pump or my training with a pump, because I ensure that your blood is saturated with the nutrients and the hormones that can make a difference. My pump, I believe, is much more retaining than the, and volumizing doing it just without supplementation. But why giant sets, okay? Because <clears throat> if I change the angle and stance and grip and tempo and everything, I am never letting your body and your muscle adapt to it. So why would I just do one straight set in the same tempo all the time? 
I varied. So body adapts very quickly. You don't let it adapt. You will see if you train same, 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 same way, after a while you reach some uh, level and then plateau. But once you incorporate all these crazy giant sets, different angles, and you know, go from four exercises to five to six, and what I was doing on the, in the camp even to 10, yeah, you don't let body adapt, you just overwhelm it. Great, um, yes, very good. So would you say then, would your workout consist of hypertrophy stimulant movements that actually cause breaking down of the tissue, we should, if and we sacroplasma it. volumization yes. workouts as well, all in one, or would you, uh, to go back to uh, Dr. George's question, would you structure the week where one workout you'd be focused on mechanical overload, let's say? No, it's, uh, it's all in one. Okay. You know, so I did this also when, when I have a six days a week and I, I, I could do two workouts. I try to separate heavy duty and then separately volumization, sarcoplasmic. What I realize is I don't want to too much of the same type of stimulus. So if you do heavy duty, heavy duty, heavy duty, heavy duty, as you know, Dorian Yates, Mike Manzer, Arthur Jones, they were limiting. When you do heavy duty, you limit the volume, okay? So for me, two exercises for each body part, I do heavy duty style, and immediately after that, I switch to the giant sets or my intensification, cercoplasmic type of training. Brilliant, I mean, there's mm -hmm. a lot of insightful information here for sure, so again, we, we don't have a lot of time, so we have another question here at the front. Yes. Hello from Turkey, Mr. Hello. Los. <laughs> uh, I want to question this for is last 10 days for competition. Because, you know, it's, we coach, it's all coaches, uh, it's changing. Just, uh, last two days, very changed, it's competition. Uh, athlete, uh, 10 days, very important. Uh, how is your uh, protocol of this last 10 days? Just thinking. What is my protocol in the last 10 days? Yes. Okay, so, good question because I want people to understand. Yes. Not the last 10 days, all your life, each and every day, you do what you're supposed to do. So, as I said in the beginning, you want a fat burning yes. and a muscle building. Okay, but if you're close Just to the contest. Last 10 days for yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. on the stage. I understand. So, if you did everything properly, by the 10 days before a competition, you're supposed to burn all the body fat. So you are already ready, right? Your metabolism is going, you save the muscle. Now the last 10 days is manipulation of glycogen storage and intracellular hydration. So last 10 days before a contest, you don't really train to build more muscle. You don't train to lose more body fat. That two processes are done. Just peaking for the contest. What is correct peak, peaking, okay? Correct peaking would be if you step on a stage fully loaded with glycogen in the muscle, fully hydrated intracellularly, least amount of body fat and least amount of extracellular hydration. So that's a winning combination when I step on this stage to compete. If I am full and dry and big, right, I win the contest. So this last 10 days, what I would do, because the diet was co constant, continuous throughout the whole year. Now it's, I'm just gonna manipulate. So what I do, and I'm gonna say this because Swiss nutrition uh, uh, owner is right here, big expert in, uh, in the field. We, we discussed this about peaking. He doesn't really uh, like complete depletion of a glycogen because it's kind of risky, so he's seen that people then super uh, compensate, they eat too much, and then they, they lose the condition. And rightfully so, it's very safe not to go to extremes. But with me, I test everybody. So I would test you in advance, two weeks out. I would try to deplete your glycogen storage completely. And if you are depleted, then, and only then, your body would supercompensate. Normally, if you deplete half, if I deplete half of the bottle, half can come back in. But you, when you empty completely, you create this urgency 
a, a, a alarm in your body. It's no more glycogen, no more reserve, okay? As soon as you start taking carbohydrates, now your body is going to want to res reserve more than previously. Keep in mind, when you are low body fat, body fat is very low. So body doesn't have a fat reserve, and now it doesn't have a carbohydrate reserve. It's a panic mode. So as soon as you start taking carbohydrates, everything is dumped in the muscle, and you can really super compensate. That's the only purpose. So you can create illusion of a much bigger muscle than you actually have by super compensation. So while uh, Mehmet, the Swiss uh, nutrition owner, you, you are very, very uh, on point, right? Not to risk. I work with the uh, elite athletes that every little thing make difference. So if I can super compensate Nasser al somebody, right? Or please take a, a look at my picture of, uh, let's say, 99 British Grand Prix. I pinned it on my Instagram because I was next to Ronnie Coleman, Flex Wheeler, Kevin Leveroni, right? I did this super compensated. I create the illusion of being just as big as they are. I wasn't. And I did it by depleting and then super compensating. So for you or for somebody else, it would be a little bit different. How much carbs can you afford? Okay? This is what you do if your normal diet, normal diet, anabolic phase, uh, fat burning phase, if I have you on 500 grams of carbs daily, for example, then I would want to take completely glycogen out. I could probably achieve this with a three days of 150 grams of carbs, okay? And when I see that you're completely depleted, okay, then I would try to supercompensate. And I would go double the amount, 1,000 grams of carbs. And then you probably, next day, another 1,000 grams of carbs. And then you realistically look how much is retained, how much is lost for your energetic needs. But the uh, idea is you have to be more loaded, fuller than you've ever been throughout the prep. If any, any time throughout the prep you're pumped and you look in the mirror and you have a certain amount of fullness, with a proper carb loading, you have to far exceed this. And if you didn't, I would give you more carbs and more carbs and more carbs. So if you look at uh, Dennis Wolf in 2005, uh, 7 Olympia, I had to give him 5,000 grams of carbs in carb loading phase to be that full. If you remember 2007, he was crazy loaded, fully compensated and created the illusion he was right next to Ronnie Coleman and make him look small. Uh, Jamie, the giant, I just did for the, the shows, he is also the guy that I have to put 5,000 grams of carbs in three days. Crazy. But I have a guys like uh, Max Charles that 500 grams of carbs fills him up, right? So you always have to individually look what is needed. But the idea of doing this last 10 days is carb deplete only if you want a carb load. If you don't want a carb deplete carb load, you just do your normal diet. But if you're going to carb deplete, you have to honestly hit the bottom. You have to completely empty the glycogen storage. Then your body would want to supercompensate. Okay? Now, for that, people make mistake by cutting the, the salt, cutting the water. When you carb deplete, okay, I would especially give you so much salt and so much water because that gives you energy and strength. That's, let's say, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, anyway. So, accepted Thursday, Friday, when you start carb loading, oh, we have to cut the water, we have to cut the salt. Salt is essential for glucose transport. So, you want to transport that glucose into the muscle, you need sodium. Don't cut out the salt. Then we need to cut out the water. No, don't cut out the water. Drink. Let the carbs, let the sodium, let the water get stored. Once you are stored, when glycogen is there, 
water is there, then you can start releasing that subcutaneous extra uh, water that you have. That's when you can drop the salt at that time or reduce it and just watch. If you leave enough hours, 10 hours, 12, 16 hours, or 24 hours, and test it in advance, you're going to see the point when your athlete is going to achieve that perfect dryness and maintain the fullness. Do you, do you understand? Now listen, I'm trying to rush it a little bit, right? Because we are limited with time. But uh, any of my athletes, okay, are on a diet, like I told you. Maintenance phase, anabolic phase, off-season. But for me, ideally, off-season is pretty much the same as the contest. I want them to be lean. And then closer to the contest, a little bit more fat burning, a little bit more fat burning. Four weeks out, you should be fat-free. If not, two weeks out, you should be fat-free. But you, you ask 10 days, okay? So 10 days already, you should be fat-free. Now we just drop the uh, glycogen and reload it. And don't be afraid to reload because now your fat is gone, right? And when you have those carbs, there's a, a lot of capacity to store a lot. It's just people are afraid. And I understand, better safe than sorry. And I'm guilty of overspilling few people because push and push and push, okay? I am guilty, you know, because sometimes you, you get greedy. But that's why we tested. So if you test like two weeks out, and maybe you go just a little under, but be open-minded, push more carbs than normally. And even if you spill over two weeks out, what's the big deal? You're going to get back in, in 24 hours, you're going to get back to normal. So be a little bit more advantageous. Yeah, that's brilliant. And uh, like Milos was saying many times, and, and I think probably if we go back to, you know, the decades that you were very competitive in, a lot of the oh. athletes were in incredible shape almost all year. And, and that's kind of the secret, really. And it's not really a secret. It's, it's just hard work. It's staying within that striking distance where you can really learn the body. So then you're not doing anything crazy in the last few days because you're already in your, your peak shape. So fantastic. Okay, any more questions we have? Yes, we have a question in the front. We have a microphone. Yes. All right. Hi, Milos. I'm Marita from Brazil. Nice to have you here. And the question is what I need to eat right before the training when I'm going to train a lacking part of the body. Okay. Hello from, I didn't hear your name from Brazil. But I have a lot of uh, love for Brazil because I love so much uh, Brazilian soccer players and Brazilian MMA fighters. And I know that uh, Brazil is huge in the fitness and uh, wellness and bikini and uh, all, all the groups. So what would you need to eat? Okay, if you're going to train with the weights, muscle contraction needs glucose for the fuel. So you would need to have that glucose to train properly. I know that a lot of girls are afraid of eating carbs. And the modern trend is no carbs, no carbs, low carbs. Okay, you can adjust carbs and have that fat burning phase and maintenance phase meals with no carbs. Good protein and good fats. Good protein and good fats. But when you train, why do you train? You want to stimulate the muscle. You want to deliver something to the muscle. You must have glucose, okay? That glucose, carbohydrate, so if you ask what, I will give you rice, potatoes, sweet potatoes, oats, quinoa, whatever choice of carbs you want and like eating because that's going to give you that glucose energy for the actual workout, okay? So don't be afraid to eat carbs before during and right after. This is anabolic phase. This is whatever you have is going to be transported in exact muscle that you train. It's going to be much more effective. So training is to deliver everything in the muscle. The rest of the day, you can have a fat burning and maintenance. So that's when you can choose, okay, I prefer eating a fats, and uh, protein with no carbs, no problem. I will give you because 
Your body normally, for normal activity, aerobic activity, everyday activity, can use fats efficiently for energy. Only major problem with the training with no carbohydrate is muscle need glucose, and if you don't give a glucose, muscle and body is going to find a way to get the glucose. It's going to convert amino acids into the glucose. So now, either amino acids, protein that's supposed to build your, your body, if you don't have enough protein, then it's going to convert, break down your muscle to, do, to give you the glucose for that energy. So it's counterproductive. So for the last 30 years, I always did the same. Any of my athletes, if you ask, female athletes, male athletes, I would always give them carbohydrates absolutely for the before training, during, and immediately after. Hello, Mr. Badabudai. <laughs> Good to see you. All right, pleasure seeing you. Did, did that answer the question? Yeah, don't be afraid to eat carbs before and right after the workout. Thank you. Yes, great question. Uh, we have another question at the front there. What's your name and what's your question? Uh, hello from Morocco. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much uh, for your time. Basically, if uh, someone is very uh, gifted with a tight and small waist and he want to do a really good off-season, but in the same time, he don't want to push his waist, you know, as a classic competitor. So what do you suggest, like to push the carbs or just keep it like the same, you know what I mean? Oh, I think it's not clear. I'm not sure that I okay, understand. Okay, so the athlete is a very slim waist. Sorry? A very slim waist. Slim waist? Which is an asset of his. And he needs to put on some muscle. So in the off-season, would you push the food with risk of creating some sort of distension, or would you keep him close to a contest ready? Right. Yes. Yeah. So the, the athlete with a small waist that wants to put the size, yeah. right? This is the question. Yes, I mean, that's the best case scenario because if your waist is small, beautiful, we're going to keep it small, but we're going to have a frequent small intakes of the nutrients to make sure that this is not happening. So your uh, maintenance phases and anabolic phases are maybe going to be shorter. I had, back in the day, similarly, eight meals a day. Normally, for normal people, I would have six meals, but I had eight frequent, frequent, Good amino acids from a good sources of protein, chicken, turkey, beef, fish, whatever, right? And then carbohydrates according to my activities. And I would split in uh, eight small meals. So you want to build muscle, you don't want to build the big stomach, right? So you always watch. You don't want to overload when you really feel sluggish and food is not digesting. And if you choose the foods that agree with your stomach, right? that you are easily digesting, then it should be absolutely no problem. So I would still force you to have uh, two grams of protein per pound, okay? And I would watch, make sure that anabolic phase push all these nutrients into the muscle. So you, you, if you're my athlete, you have to grow. If you're not growing, the diet that I gave you is not sufficient. I need to up the carbs, up the protein, right? It's for you or for anybody else, you are designing your uh, program. In one week, nothing happens, obviously, not enough calories and carbohydrates. Because I always believe if you're going to cover the protein, protein must be. If you don't have enough protein, I would tell you, don't even bother training. Stay home, watch TV, you know, don't, don't be a competitor. So protein is a must, okay? Now, carbohydrates, if you are a smaller guy, I would much rather give you super high carbs, super high protein, because you're lean, you don't have to worry about uh, carbohydrates, I would give you high carbs. I talked to Jay Cutler the other day, he was eating 1,000 grams of carbs. I was eating about 700 grams of carbs normally, sometimes more, right? So that's a lot of calories, right? But it's nutrients, of a choice for muscle contractions and glycogen uh, repletion. So th this is how it is, and carbs are easy to digest. Yeah? 
that, that's a great question, and Nilosh has thought a lot on today about you know pre-digested supplements as well, where you can really get them into you, and obviously using the right tools, as he was saying, that works with the athletes. So, great question. I just want to say, obviously, I used to come to a lot of seminars and webinars, and you know, I would be the guy in the audience that wanted to ask a question but never did. So, you know, if you feel like you have a question, you know, we have Milos Sarchev, the mind on stage, your opportunity. Okay, yes, sir. What's your name and what's your question? Thank you, sir. Good evening. And I'm very grateful to, to see you in personal, actually. So I just want to ask, during in competition days, what is the right time to do cardio and why? What's, what's the right time to do cardio? Yeah. And why? Yes, sir. Okay. There is a lot. Look, if you Google anything nowadays, you can find pros and cons all the time, all the time. But for me, I don't need to read a scientific journal to determine what makes sense or doesn't make sense. So the same question you ask, I was asked back in 1990s by the Flex Magazine editorial. They asked me, when did you do cardio? When is the best to do cardio? So my opinion at that time was, anytime I do the cardio, doesn't matter. It's the same, you burn fatty acids as a fuel, so it's the same result. And then they show me some studies that, okay, University of Illinois back in the day, that if you do it in a fasted state, there's about 30% or more of uh, additional fat burning. Because at the fasted state, immediately, your body starts using fatty acids as a fuel. So it's much quicker to do it if you are completely devoided of any nutrients for a long time. So the best time for cardio, for me, that I can claim, experiencing myself and hundreds of my clients, is an empty stomach first thing in the morning, always. And don't believe these stories when you hear, no, 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 it doesn't matter. I, I had these arguments all the time. Look, these scientists, they t take untrained individual and they do something, excuse my language, BS. And it's not real study. I study with elite athletes, with the people that really want to make a difference, and I put them on this plan or on that plan, and then I compare. This plan is better, okay? So if this plan is better and I want to maximize your progress, I have to choose that plan. So if you're my athlete, cardio, have to be on empty stomach first thing in the morning. Enjoy that morning cardio. Yes, sir. What's your name and what's your question? Hi, Milos. Uh, Hello. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you for your time. Uh, so you're speaking about high protein, uh, the two grams per pound, which really goes against a lot of the new age science. Yes. Um, but my question is regarding when you're in the high calorie phase and digestion. Um, if you have an athlete who's taking all this protein, all these calories, but now he's not digesting, he's having constipation, he's having, I mean, let's be real, right? This is what happens in the real world with a lot of athletes. Yes. How, how do you fix that? How do you take 5,000, 6,000 calories, 7,000 calories and move it through the body yeah. without creating this distension? I know the eight meals helps. At the same time, you're going through two grams of protein per day plus the thousand grams of net carbs and the fat. So let's talk about how do we move this food yeah. and absorb it properly and not get this gut that yeah. hangs out about five inches, you know, so, over your waist. Yeah, great question, and it's a problem with everybody, yes. So first, you said the interesting uh, what I say about up to two grams of protein per pound, it's against the science, yes. But which scientist actually tried to use two grams per pound on an Olympia competitor and compare what is better, what is sufficient, one gram, one and a half, or two? All these studies and scientists that using uh, sedentary individuals, you know, some average Joe. I tried with myself first, and you know Nasser al somebody. So when Nasser al somebody came to my uh, house and he looked at my journals and he saw that I take every single day 500 grams of protein and he's looking at me like, you small punk, 
you eat that much? I say, yeah. How much you eat? He was eating 250. I said, no, sir. What is the only building nutrient that your body can get? Carbohydrates, fats, or proteins? Uh, protein, okay. So you train twice a day. You want to increase your muscle mass. You want to muscle protein synthesis. What is this P? Oh, protein, muscle protein synthesis. How is protein going to be synthesized if you don't take enough protein? You degrade the protein from uh, contractions, catabolic activity. So you need to. So bottom line is Nasser went to 600 grams a day. And you see what happened with Nasser from 94 to 95, transformed into the top three Olympia competitor. All my athletes, I force them to take so much protein. Now, some have a digestion problem. Not with everything. You have a different protein sources, chicken, turkey, fish, egg whites, whatever, and then see what works for them. Some people are allergic to eggs, they don't take it, okay. I give them protein of choice that they can digest. Smaller portions, usually is no big deal. Bigger portions, if you have an issue and you feel there is food is sit sitting there, first, of course, I'm gonna give you digestive enzymes for a protein, right? If this is what is the issue. If you can digest fats, you give the enzymes lipases for the fats. Carbohydrates are usually easy to digest, so you don't need to take that enzyme amylase, right? But all the, the nutrients have the enzymes that break it down. Absolutely. And if it's broken down, everything is flowing. If it's stuck, oh yeah, first you try with the digestive enzymes. And then, if it's still a problem, uh, I'm, I'm you can digest the beef. So I'm online, I'm going Okay, I'm not gonna get, get your beef. There's a million other sources. Or what I've been doing with, okay, I'm gonna say Samson Deuda, for example, right now. He couldn't have a 300 grams of uh, beef or 300 grams of, okay, I, I would give him 150 and I would give him uh, extra whey protein with it. So, solid food and protein supplement to add up to my protein uh, source, the, the result at the end. I have uh, many guys that eat only maybe three meals, but they have uh, five protein shakes. I'm sure that you are following Hunter Labrada. Hunter Labrada is doing a lot of protein shakes. Protein shakes are much easier to digest. If it's whey, within 20, 30 minutes, you get amino acids available. There is always a solution, but if a person can right away say, I am sluggish, I cannot digest, change the protein source and then mix it. If you think about it, right, why do we eat chicken and turkey and fish and beef for a protein content? Well, 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 not really. We are, we are taking for a essential amino acid content of that protein. Essential aminos are why we eat all this food, not any aminos, because non-essential body can manufacture it. So essential aminos. Most of my clients, what I would do, I would have them take essential amino acids in between meals. So I can reduce your protein portion size, and I give you essential amino acids, 10 grams, in between meals. If you listen to my uh, presentation from beginning, my goal for you, for example, if you are my athlete, I want constant influx of amino acids all the time, all day, all day. So muscle needs it is there. Your hair, your bones, your organs, it's always there. I don't want one moment of the day that you are deficient with aminos. I want to make sure that aminos are available because if you have a limited amount of aminos, okay, and uh, your organs need and your muscle needs, well, guess what? Organs have priority. It's not gonna be a push to the muscle. So muscle protein synthesis suffer because there's not enough building nutrients. So aminos are gonna go for a physiological preference first. And muscle is least of the preference. If you think about it, muscle tissue, extra muscle tissue, is storage of extra protein. Body fat can be stored easily. Carbohydrates can be easily stored in liver and, and muscle. 
But where is protein stored? Extra protein is stored in your muscle tissue. So that's the storage. So yeah, I understand maybe you're still thinking, oh, Milos didn't answer my question. Yeah, I answered. There is protein sources that you have to test for you and with all your clients. What is easier to digest? So once you find that, beautiful. You have them frequently on those uh, protein sources. And then you just add the carbs, add the good fats. Yeah? And on that note, guys, remember Swiss Nutrition uses only the finest supplements, ingredients in the world. So you can get your supplementation from Swiss Nutrition. Yes, sir, on the front, what's your name? What's your question? Hello, guys. My name is Solar. Um, I'd like to ask Milos, how do you see the current bodybuilding scenario uh, in global? Because uh, especially about the difference between the, the golden age shapes and uh, the current one. So like, for, for example, the, the golden age, for, if you put in the, on the stage today, they're going to be more like the, the men's physique that we have right now. And how do you see the, the big guys going on the stage today? So you asked you a question that might get you a lot of trouble. <laughs> what, what's your intake on the, the new age bodybuilding versus the, the old age bodybuilding, right? The, the question is about the uh, difference from uh, massive guys or aesthetic guys? Yes, yeah, yes. Basically yeah. like that. I mean, uh, <laughs> I'll get myself in trouble because the judges are here, right? But uh, look, we all know that bodybuilding is supposed to be about the shape, about the muscular beauty of a man's physique, right? So when you look at uh, back in the history of Olympia, Frank Zane, who is 185 pounds, won three Olympias, right? So when you just think about it, it was not extreme muscle mass that would win the shows. So I always hope that once the, the judges give direction to more aesthetic, more shapely, the trend is going to be there then if winners are shapely, everybody else is going to try to be shapely. If winners are big, everybody's going to try to be big. Now, I'm a huge fan of Big Rami. I love the guy. And you, you just can't ignore it. He's so wide proportionate and, you know, freaky. I, I understand why he is a winner. I completely understand. So it's not easy to judge. I mean, I try to judge some shows. And you can't ignore when somebody is really so wide, so muscular, so defined. Like, example, um, Jay Cutler, 2009, Dexter Jackson. I love Dexter's physique 100 times more. 100 times more, Dexter Jackson is my guy. But then I see Jay Cutler, 2009, overwhelming. Yes, he has a much wider waist, but he has a much wider shoulders. And then he is so much thicker, so much more muscular. I can see how judges can be frustrated and, and say, well, it's still bodybuilding. <laughs> you know, I, I wish it's shape only. I wish. I hope very judges good, are not very here. Good. Amazing. We have time for a, a few more questions, Hello? at least one. And then we're going to do some awards. So, you okay with the questions? Yeah, Hello? I'm okay with any questions. Yeah, hi Milos. So, sir, we have an online question from Nima Sto from United Arab Emirates. What are the three misconceptions about food and training? What are, what are the three misconceptions of food and training? What are the three misconceptions with food and training? Three misconceptions. <laughs> well, first, that carbs are your enemy. Okay? Carbs are not your enemy. Carbs are best friends for bodybuilders, really. Okay, so that's the one thing. Yes, to lose body fat, many people have to go low carbs. Well, why? Because they got themselves fat in the off-season. So don't get fat. Your carbs are your, your friends, not your enemies. Because again, carbs increase the blood sugar level. Blood sugar level increases release of insulin. Insulin is an anabolic hormone and stores it. So that's uh, one thing. Uh, training wise, go heavy or go home. No, 
I, you know, go heavy means risk. I, just about any heavy duty guy that I know has torn muscles, injuries, because let's face it, when you push yourself to the limit, something's gotta go. Muscle, tendon, ligament. And uh, yeah, it's very, very risky. So I am strict believer in train smarter, not, and not harder necessarily, smarter. Stimulate, not annihilate, like uh, uh, Lee Haney was, would say. And uh, the other misconception that I was saying earlier, salt is your enemy, salt is your friend. My father back in the day always told me, he asked me a question, what is the most important nutrient? And he told me right away, salt with water, obviously. Go ahead. Great. Very good. Hi, I'm Puria from Iran. Uh, I have a question. Iranian. Yeah, thank you. I love Iran. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, I have a question about uh, water and salt one or two days out of compass. And uh, I want to know, um, do you remove or reduce salt and salt uh, for your athlete? And, uh, uh, or it depends for the uh, body of your athlete. You remove or reduce? The water and the salt, the last two days, you take it out before the contest, right? Yeah, yeah. So my water and salt? Yeah. That's the, the, okay. I said a little bit earlier. Believe me, and I know, listen, many different coaches do many different things. And I've seen that some people cut the water, cut the salt and all this. It's old fashioned way, but when you think physiologically, why would you? you know, I don't cut salt. I just said salt is so important. I would encourage all the athletes from any sport to take more salt than they're doing. Himalayan salt, sea salt, doesn't matter. That's the power, you need it. So don't cut it out, unless you are a hypertension patient. If you have a high blood pressure and doctor told you not to. If you're not, salt, salt, salt. Hydrate, 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 as much as possible, okay? And then, closer to the contest, when you wanna achieve that crazy look, first, if every day you have high salt, high water and high carbs, and you look, and you're in shape. You're almost ready for a contest, okay? So you know, I just need to drop a little bit of water. That already tells you, your body is not retaining water each and every day. That means it's gonna be easy to peak for the contest. So I would, at that time, okay, increase water intake a little bit Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and slightly decrease Thursday, Friday, slightly. Sodium, I would have a little bit higher Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and slightly Thursday, Friday. Once your glycogen is in and you feel full, okay, then and only then you can drop the salt and water or reduce it very, very low. First, you need to put the water in the muscle and water to go in the muscle, and glycogen to go in the muscle, you need salt. So don't cut it out soon. If you cut salt sooner, you would see you can't get full. Your body is just not getting that crazy fullness because you need sodium to transport the glucose. So really, you don't need to worry about this all that, like, until Friday, midday, competition is Saturday, okay. Preferably, if you're my athlete, you will be super full. If you're super full, okay, now we can reduce. Now it's just maintaining, so cut on half, cut on half. You don't need to go zero. I know that some people go zero, you don't need to. So even, okay, you are from Iran. My athlete, I love him, Behruz Tabani, right? You've seen his condition in Romania. It was crazy condition, super dry, everything, right? Ask him, water and salt all the way to the, to the day of the contest. Fantastic. Some really good questions here. We have time for one more question now. So there we have. Love your t-shirt, by the way. What's your name? What's your question, sir? Hey, Milos. Uh, my name is Mohammed. Uh, I'm from Syria. My question is about the training. So you've mentioned Dorian Yates' way of training. 
And uh, I wanted to know more about your way of training and the difference since we do live in a fast moving country. Let's uh, take UAE as an example. And we do have work and sometimes sleep isn't on point. So I want to know what's your take on that and how do you implement your way of training when a person is limited in terms of uh, the amount he rests and the amount of food he can take? Amount of? I'm sorry, can you just repeat the last part of the uh, question? Amount of? Amount of rest. Rest. Rest? rest? Yeah. yeah. Rest. You rest when you die. You don't need to rest. <laughs> okay. So, training has to be stimulating, right? In order to make a change for your physique to respond to the stimulus, right? You have to shock the body. So everybody believe before you have to go just heavy, 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 break down the muscle fiber, create the muscle damage, and they would suggest six, seven, eight reps all out. That's uh, science-wise. But then throughout the years, many pros that I know, top elite pros, never did anything under 10, 12, 15 repetitions, okay? And they still have that size. Now, a lot of science is approving this. There's not just stimulus, heavy or medium load. Somebody say something? I think the crowd is shouting. They're loving the questions and answers. You can go on, yeah. Somebody, okay. So, you don't have to necessarily go just heavy. It's volume that you do. It's not just intensity. It's total amount of volume. I'm sorry to cut you off. You mentioned that uh, you've implemented some heavy movement. Um, let's say you want to give an example of a workout. How will work? My workout, you? okay. Yeah. So my workout to accomplish everything, I would do two exercises, heavy duty. That's the start. So. Guys in the audience, can you just lower the tone a little bit? We're just wrapping up a few more minutes with respect. Thank you. Okay. Hopefully, I'm not disturbing anybody. I don't, I don't know what is this about. But so if I train you, and let's say you're going to do chest or back or whatever, I'm going to pick two exercises for you. Then I'm going to do heavy duty system. You start, first set is going to be control eccentric, control, control concentric, okay? That you just feel the range of motion. Add the weight, controlled, explosive. Add the weight, all out. Third set, and then I'm gonna, for the 10 repetitions or more, and then that fourth set, I'm gonna let you challenge with six, eight repetition max. I would probably be there to force a couple of sets, a couple of reps, and maybe do the negative. That's the first exercise that's uh, in a heavy duty style, progressive overload. I'm already warmed up. So the second exercise, you don't need to warm up too much, but I would still go slow eccentric, slow concentric. So you prepare the body and the tendons and the ligaments. They feel the weight, okay? And then next two sets, I will go heavier. Slow eccentric, explosive. So in these two sets, I give my heavy duty stimulus. Okay, my fibral hypertrophy reason to grow. After this, now everything else that I do, I want to be honest to myself. I have to feel the muscle. So for a long time under the tension, P contraction, squeeze like a maniac, or go eccentrically super slow, or stretched for a prolonged time, or P contraction. There is four points of the movement: lowering. You, you normally lower like four seconds. Why four? Why not five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? Normally, in a stretch position, you don't wait. Why not wait? You can stretch for one second, two, three, four, five, ten, right? Concentrically, everybody just go explosive. Why? Why don't you try one, two, three, four, ten? Change the tempo, right? And many people are going to realize, oh my God. When I go super slow, I feel my muscle. Of course. Now there's new stimulus, new information, and that's how your body doesn't adapt to it. So I change my tempo all the time. And then I do my giant sets. Why giant sets? 
because different angle of simulation, different type of contraction. You know, it's just, don't be monkey see, monkey do. Okay, I've only seen these four exercises. Arnold Schwarzenegger did only these four exercises. Okay, only four, why not more? So maybe you find the exercise for you that work better than any other exercise that you read in the magazine. You know, you have to connect with the muscle and then really maximally contract. You know, there's levels to the contraction, a little bit or more and more and more. A lot of people just contract as hard to move the weight. But if you contract as hard as you can, every time you're going to see the difference. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Question, yes. um, guys, girls, I think that you can all agree we've, we've been in for a treat here. There's been a lot of great informative knowledge passed over. And first and foremost, just join me in well, giving Milos a huge round of applause and thank you for today. Milos, thank uh, you. Thank so you. Much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Are we now going to bring on the CEO of Mission Strong to give away some gift hampers? Akbar Asain, I'd like to welcome you onto the stage now, sir. First, we want to give Milos and obviously the CEO of Swiss Nutrition, Mamet. Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to thank Mission Strong to bring me here, Dubai Master Show, and the Swiss Nutrition. Thank you. I really enjoy Dubai Pro. Yes. For me? Oh, thank, thank you very you much. Thank you so much. Give him a round of applause. Milos Sarchev, thank you so thank much. You. Swiss Nutrition, number one sports and supplements, and Dubai Pro Promoter. Abdil Alali, welcome to the stage, my man. I appreciate and apologize if I didn't quite get your name correct. Thank you so much. Such a great event. And the last one is to Christian Williams as well, I believe. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the show. We are in for a treat as we set up here in Dubai's Pro Show. Some incredible athletes. Give them a welcome and a round of applause as they come on. And have a good day and the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.